Good morning. All our readings this morning contain wonderful images of growing things and comparing them to what God and God's kingdom are like. Oddly enough, my mind went to asparagus. Yes, you heard right, asparagus. It's one of my favorite vegetables. As a child, I wasn't a huge fan of vegetables, but I always loved asparagus, and it could have had something to do with the yummy cheese sauce my mom made and which I slathered on. It was also a treat, as we only got it when it was in season for a very short time in the spring, and if some kind person who grew it gave us some. I think the fact that it was a spring harvest after a long Saskatchewan winter also added to its appeal. But that isn't really why I am thinking about it. When I was in the Diocese of Capel, our bishop, Michael Pierce, who as an aside went on to be our primate, used to say that he always considered it an optimistic sign when a priest planted asparagus. The reason? It takes three years of growth before it produces fruit. Produces vegetables? Well, you know what I mean. Um, he took the planting of asparagus to be an indication that the priest was committed to staying with the parish into the future, that the priest was willing to grow roots in the parish, a promise of constancy and consistency. As I was considering our readings for today, I remembered what Archbishop Pierce had said, and to be sure this was indeed accurate, I looked up the planting of asparagus. It does indeed take three years to mature, and even then, the first few years are not a plentiful harvest. There are also other important factors to consider when planting it. It takes some care, some planning, and some nurturing, but then, what a reward in the end. I guess that is if you like asparagus. I could write a parable, couldn't I? Now, I realize not all of you are as enthusiastic about this vegetable as I am, but perhaps you can ride the wave of my enthusiasm? As you know, Jesus used parables to teach the truth about God and the kingdom of heaven. In this morning's gospel, we hear two such parables. These parables, like others, certainly contain messages of reassurance, but it is not always an easy path to that conclusion. Parables were not just used as a comparative way to teach, but were used to wake people up from human understanding and complacency to the reality of God. I read an interesting description of parables that compares them to fables, and here it is. A parable is intended to be disruptive, to interrupt what you thought you knew, and not just teach you something, but actually to confront you with a surprising and often unwanted truth. Fables are handy when you want to give kids some good advice or teach them some moral or practical lesson. Who doesn't remember the lesson of the tortoise and the, ha the hare, slow and steady, pays off? Or the boy who cried wolf, honesty is the best policy. Parables, on the other hand, are useful when the truth you want to share is difficult, whether difficult to hear, comprehend, or believe. And that's the end of the quote. In the parables we hear this morning, we hear that God is in charge, that although we may plant seeds, we are actually unaware, dare I say ignorant, of the ways that God works. We are challenged to faith and trust in God's ways. We are challenged to think big, that God's ways are more than we can ask or imagine. Even while we are sleeping, whether that is being asleep at the switch or actually asleep in our beds, God is at work. This parable, I think, calls for humility and humble hearts. Something that this first parable has challenged me in is the idea of seed planting. What seeds am I planting? How am I attentive to my spiritual disciplines? How am I reflecting the love of Jesus Christ in my daily encounters and actions? How do I distinguish my will from the will of God? In my life, these are questions I need to constantly wrestle with. I am so grateful for Christian community where these challenges can be shared and where together 
we can grow in the knowledge and love of Christ. Another challenge is humility. How much do I credit myself or, on the other hand, put pressure on myself to knowing the right way or the right answers without discerning the will of God and being willing to discern that will, not only on my own, but in the context of community? As Paul says in his first letter to the Corinthians, I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. Right now, I am hearing from a lot of people who are weary. This past year and a half has been extremely tiring, and that weariness is producing feelings of despondency, discouragement, and sometimes anger and frustration. So perhaps a call to be is an exhausting thought at this point. Maybe what we are looking for is encouragement. Some scholars believe that Jesus is linking the parable of the mustard seed to the passage that we heard from Ezekiel. I believe we can find some encouragement here. As we have been hearing in previous sermons, Mark's gospel was written in a brutal time. Mark constantly points to the kingdom of heaven, now on earth and in the heavenly future. The Roman regime was cruel and unrelenting, And the kingdom of heaven was, in addition to a challenge, a message of hope. In the Ezekiel passage, the community also found themselves in a place of hardship as they suffered and grieved in exile under a harsh and cruel foreign regime. Mark's small mustard seed and Ezekiel's twig form from a cedar provide messages of hope and renewal to a suffering world. Ezekiel speaks of a twig from a great cedar. This twig taken from the large cedar can be seen as a messianic image, a sign of hope and renewal for the people of Israel. It connects them to their past, but leads them into the possibility of a renewed and new new future. The glory of God will be revealed to all as the mountaintop implies, and this new and mighty growth will provide rest and sanctuary. In the parable of the mustard seed, again we see the kingdom beginning with something small, a seed, but then growing into something significant that again provides sanctuary. The idea of sanctuary is an appealing one to the weary and discouraged. The word sanctuary comes from the Latin and means a holy or sacred place. A sanctuary is a container for holy or precious things or people. Sanctuary can also mean asylum, a place of safety. So the kingdom of heaven represents, well, actually is, sanctuary. It is a place with God where we are considered precious and holy. It is a place where we can exist in safety. As we build our Christian communities, our churches, we want them to be places of holiness and safety for ourselves and for others. This growth of the marvelous kingdom of heaven can be seen in the small things, the simple act of planting in trust and hope that God will do something wonderful with the seeds. The kingdom of heaven welcomes the planters and provides rest to the weary. This vision is one that's encouraging. Now, back to asparagus. To grow asparagus, I need to have a vision. I know what asparagus looks like and tastes like, and I know that I really enjoy it, fresh and tender. I have a vision that involves more than one of my senses. The first concrete step in realizing this vision is to plant it. We can spend a lot of time and energy trying to write vision statements, But the vision of the church is the kingdom of heaven. We know that sadly, sometimes the church or individuals within the church lose sight of the vision and their actions can cause others to lose sight. When the vision of heaven is confused with entitlement and power, people get hurt. Sometimes in our own lives, we lose sight of the vision. It may be because we are hurt or discouraged 
It may be that we have become distracted by other things. However, that doesn't mean that the vision no longer exists. The Gospels contain many parables where Jesus likens the kingdom of heaven to various earthly things. And these parables are meant to be disruptive. They disrupt us from our current mindset and point us to a place of hope and renewal. One of the roles of the church is to provide sanctuary for those who are lost, afraid, discouraged, feeling worthless and cast out. One of the beautiful things about a healthy church community is that roles can change. By that, I mean at one time, I may be one who offers sanctuary, and another time, I may be one who seeks sanctuary. Having received sanctuary, I respond in gratitude by reaching out to others. I respond in gratitude by doing the work of the kingdom, often in the little things, through small acts of kindness, through getting to know the stranger, through lending a listening ear, through acts of hospitality and generosity. Kingdom work is owning up to mistakes and asking for forgiveness. Kingdom work is living out the golden rule by doing for others what I would have them do for me. Kingdom work is a grateful response to a generous gift. Archbishop Mark MacDonald, the Anglican Church of Canada's Indigenous Archbishop, speaks of their sacred circles where, as he puts it, the gospel is at the centre. Even in these dark days, he is not without hope, and he speaks openly and honestly and teaches, but he does so without anger. In a sacred circle, all come together, no one in the front, no one in the back, but all in a circle with the gospel in the centre. To me, this is a vision of the kingdom of heaven. Through something called gospel-based discipleship, they seek the will of God in their deliberations and look for consensus in their decision-making. Each person has a chance to speak, and while that person is speaking, everyone listens. It is meant to be a place of sanctuary and from the safe and nurturing place that has placed the gospel at its center Growth and renewal can happen. Transformation is possible. When I was reading about planting asparagus, I learned a few things. Before planting, the soil has to be prepared, which includes removing all weeds and grasses and can take up to a year. Like that twig from the top of the cedar, you plant the crowns and you need to surround them with rich soil and plant them 18 inches apart you need to give the plant space to grow. In the next couple of years, careful weeding and watering need to take place. As the asparagus matures, you can't get greedy in the harvest. You can only harvest for a couple of weeks the first year, and then the first year after three years, and then three weeks the next, and gradually increasing over the next few years. That takes patience, doesn't it? But apparently, once the plants are established, you will have an abundant spring crop for the next 20 or 30 years. Now there's a vision to hang on to. Little by little, small step by small step, with care, space, and attention, there will be abundance, which means nourishment to share with many. We can plant and we can care, but God provides the growth. Those beautiful green shoots are God's creation. And the growing happens even when we are sleeping in a way that we can't see. In these months ahead, as we wrestle with the challenges of our present time, let us take comfort that God is at work even as we sleep, that our participation in the growing of the kingdom can be in small and faithful acts, and that there is sanctuary a safe and holy place where we are known and loved. Thanks be to God.